from Boston, Massachusetts. It's theCUBE, covering LiveWorks 18. Brought to you by PTC. Welcome back to Boston, everybody. This is the LiveWorks show hosted by PTC, and you're watching theCUBE, the leader in live tech coverage. I'm Dave Vellante with my co-host, Stu Miniman, covering IOT, blockchain, AI, the edge, the cloud, the core, all kinds of crazy stuff going on. Kevin Ashton is here, he's the inventor of the term IOT and the creator of the Wemo home automation platform, you may be familiar with that, the smart plugs. And he's also the co-founder and CEO of Zensi, which is a clean tech startup. Kevin, thanks for coming on theCUBE. Thank you for having me. You're very welcome. So, impressions of live work so far. Oh wow, I, I've been to a few of these and this is the, the biggest one so far, I think. I mean, it's day one and uh, the place is hopping. It's like, it's really good energy here. It's hard to believe it's a Monday. Well, so. it's interesting, right? I mean, you bring the sort of staid manufacturing world together with this sort of technology world and gives you this interesting cocktail. What I think you, the what manufacturing world was staid in the 1900s, but in the, <laughs> the 21st century, it's kind of the, the thing to be doing. So, yeah, yeah and, and this, I guess this is, you're right, this is not what people think of when they think of manufacturing, but this is, this is really what it looks like now. It's a digital, energetic, young, exciting, innovative space. Very hip, and a lot of you know, virtual reality, augmented reality. Okay, so this term IOT, you're yep. credited, you go to Wikipedia, look up Kevin, you'll see that you're credited with inventing, creating that term. Yeah. Where'd it come from? Oh, so IOT is the Internet of Things, uh, and back in the 1990s, I was a junior manager at Procter & Gamble, consumer goods company. And we were having trouble keeping some products on the shelves in the stores, and I had this idea of putting this new technology called RFID tags, little, little microchips, into all Procter & Procter Gamble makes like two billion products a year or something, and putting it into all of them and connecting it to this other new thing called the internet so we would know where our stuff was. And, um, you know, the challenge I faced as a young executive with a crazy idea was how to explain that to, to senior management. Um, and these were guys who, uh, in those days, like, they didn't even do email. You sent them an email, they'd like have their secretary print it out and they'd hand write a reply. It would come back to you in the internal mail. I'm not, I mean, really not yeah. kidding. And so, um, you know, and I would have put chips in everything. Well, the good news was, uh, about 1998, they'd heard of the internet, and, and they'd heard that the internet was a thing you were supposed to be doing. They didn't know what it was. So I literally retitled my PowerPoint presentation, which was previously called Smart Packaging, to find a way to get the word internet in. And the way I did it was I wrote Internet of Things. Uh, and I got my money, and I founded a research center with Procter & Gamble's money at MIT, just up the road here. Um, and basically took the PowerPoint presentation with me all over the world to convince other people to get on board, and uh, somehow the name stuck. So that's the story. Yeah, it's fascinating. I, I remember yeah. back, I mean, RFID was a big deal. We yeah. went through, you know, my, my background, I, I study mechanical engineering, so manufacturing. Okay. You saw the, the promise of it, but like the internet back in the 90s, it was like, this seems really cool, what are you going to do with it? Exactly, and it kind of worked. Now yeah. it's everywhere, but yeah, you're exactly right. Yeah. So I, I just you know, want you to you know when you you think back to those times and where we are in IoT, which I think most of us still say we're still relatively early in IoT, the industrial internet. Uh, yeah. the, the, what you hear when people talk about it, does it still harken back to some of the things that you thought? What what's different? What's the same? Um, I mean, so so some of the big picture stuff is very much the same. I think we had this the, the, the fundamental idea behind the MIT research behind the Internet of Things was get computers to gather their own information. If we can do that, uh, we have this whole powerful new paradigm in computing, because it's not about keyboards anymore. And in places like manufacturing, I mean, Procter & Gamble is a manufacturing company. They make things and they sell them. The problem in manufacturing is keyboards just don't scale as an information capture technology. You can't sit in a warehouse and type everything you have and something goes out the door and type it again. And so, you know, in, in the 90s, barcodes came and then we realized that we could do much better. And that was the Internet of Things. Uh, and so that big picture, wouldn't it be great if we knew where everything was automatically? That's, that's come true in a, in a times a million, right? Um, some of the technologies that are doing it are very unexpected. Like in the 1990s, we were very excited about RFID, partly because vision technology, you know, cameras connected to computers, 
was not working at all. It, it looks very unpromising. We'd, people have been trying for decades to do machine vision, and it didn't work. And, and now it does. And, and so a lot of things we thought we needed RFID for, we can now do with vision, as an example. Now, the reason vision works, by the way, is an interesting one, and I think is important for the future of the Internet of Things. Vision works because suddenly we had digital cameras connected to networks, mainly in smartphones, that were enabled to create this vast data set that could then be used to train the algorithms, right? So when it was, I've scanned in 100 images in my lab at MIT and I'm trying to write an algorithm, machine vision was very hard to do. When you've got hundreds of millions of images available to you easily because phones and digital cameras are uploading all the time, then suddenly you can make the software sing and dance. So a lot of the analytical stuff we've already seen in machine vision we'll start to see in manufacturing supply chains, for example, as the data accumulates. Did, if you go back to that time, sure. when you were doing that PowerPoint, which was probably less than a megabyte oh, when you saved it, did you have any inkling of the data explosion? And were you even able to envision how you know, data models would, would change to a company? Did you realize at the time that the data model, the data pipeline, the ability to store all this distributed data would have to change, or were you not thinking I was, that way? So, it's interesting because I was the craziest guy in the room when it <laughs> came to internet bandwidth and storage ability and how, I mean, I was, I was thinking in, maybe I was thinking in gigabytes when everyone uh -huh. else was thinking in kilobytes, right. right? That was kind of, and so, but I was, I was wrong. I wasn't too crazy, I was not crazy enough, right. you know? And so, uh, sort of, but my, I wouldn't quite go so far as to call it a regret, but my, my lesson for like the next generation of innovators coming up is you actually can't let kind of the average opinion in the room limit how, how extreme your views are. Because if it seems to make sense to you, that's all that matters, right? So I didn't envision it, is the answer to your question, even though I was envisioning stuff that seemed crazy to a lot of other people. And I wasn't the only, I'm not, I wasn't the only crazy one, but I was one of the few. And so we underestimated, even in our wildest dreams, we underestimated the, the bandwidth and memory innovations that we've seen in the last 25 years. And, and, and I don't know, you know, Stu, you're a technologist, I'm not, but, but based on what you see today, do you mm -hmm. feel like the technology infrastructure is there to support these great visions, or do we have to completely out uh, quantum computing and okay. blockchain? What, what, are we are we at the doorstep, or are we decades away? Oh, we're at the doorstep. I mean, I think the interesting thing is um, a lot of Internet of Things stuff, in particular, is is invisible for a number of reasons, right? It's invisible because you know the sensors and chips are embedded in things, and you don't see them. That's one. I mean, there is a billion more RFID tags made in the world than smartphones every year. But you don't see them, right? right? You see the smartphones, everyone's always looking at the smartphone. Um, so you don't realize that's there. So that's one reason. But I mean, the other reason is, the Internet of Things is happening in places and in companies that don't have open doors and windows, they're not on the high street, right? right. They are, um, it's warehouses, it's factories, it's behind the scenes, it's companies that have no reason to talk about what they're doing because it's a trade secret or it's, it's uh, you know, just not something people want to write about or read about, right? So. I just gave a talk here, and I, one of the examples I gave was a company called Heidelberger. Heidelberger makes 60% of the offset printing presses in the world. They're one of the first Internet of Things pioneers. Most people haven't heard of them. Most people don't see offset printers every day. So the hundreds of sensors they have in their hundreds of, of, of printing presses, completely invisible to most of us, right? So it's definitely here now. You know, will the infrastructure continue to improve? Yes. Will we see things that are unimaginable today, 20 years from today? Yes. Um, but I don't, I don't see any, any massive limitations now in what the Internet of Things can become. Just a curiosity, the use case for that offset printing is, yeah. is it predictive maintenance or yeah. it's optimization? It's it was initially like, uh, when, when, it was in the 1990s, like when, when the customer calls and says, my printing press isn't working, help. Okay. Instead of sending the guy to look at the diagnostics, have the diagnostics get sent to the guy, that was the first thing but then gradually that evolves to real-time monitoring, predictive maintenance. Um, your machine seems to be less efficient than the average of all the machines. Maybe we can help you optimize. And that's the other thing about all Internet of Things applications. You start with one sensor telling you one thing for one reason, 
and it works, you add two and you find four things you can do, and you add three and you find nine things you can do, and the next thing you know, you're an Internet of Things company. You're never meant to be, but you know, that's, that's how it goes. It's, 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 a, it's a little bit like viral or addictive. Well, it's interesting to see the re-emergence, re, you know, the new ascendancy of PTC. Yeah. I mean, there's a company in 2003 was yep. you know, bouncing along the yep. ocean's floor, and then the, the confluence of all these trends, some acquisitions, and all of a sudden they're like, the well, new kid in the hot new kid in the box. Some of that smart management, by the way. Yeah, no doubt. Um, yeah. And I, you know, I don't work for PTC, but you, navigating the change is important. And one of, the one of the other things I just talked about in my talk, but is, you know, we think about these tools that companies like PTC make as design tools, but they're very quickly transitioning to mass production tools, uh -huh. right? So it used to be, you, you imagined a thing on your screen and you made a blueprint of it and somebody made it in a shop. And then it was, you didn't, you didn't make it in a shop, you had a 3D printer. And you could make a little model of it and show management, everyone was very excited about that. Well, you know, what's happening now and what will happen more is that design on the screen will be plugged right into the production line and you'll push a button and you'll make a million or your customer will go to a website and tweak it a little bit, make it a different color or a different shape or something, and you'll make one on your production line that makes a million. So the, there's this seamless transition happening from imagining things using software to actually manufacturing them using software, which is very much the core of what the Internet of Things is about and is a really exciting part of the, the current wave of the Industrial Revolution. Mm. Yeah, so Kevin, you wrote a book which follows some of those themes, yes. I believe. It's uh, how, to, how to Fly a Horse. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I've read plenty of books where it talks about, people think that innovation is, you know, some guy sitting under a tree, it hits him in the head and yep. he does things. But we know that, first of all, almost everybody is building on, you know, the shoulders of the, those before us. Uh, talk a little bit about creativity, innovation, okay. your, your, sure. your thoughts on that. Um, so, I mean, I, I was just like, I have, a, I have an undergraduate degree in Scandinavian studies, okay? I studied Ibsen in 19th century Norwegian at university. And then I went to Procter & Gamble and I made, uh, I did marketing for color cosmetics. And then the next thing that happened to me was I'm at MIT, right? I'm an executive director of this prestigious lab at MIT. And I did this at the same time that the Harry Potter books were becoming popular, right? So I really felt like, oh my God, I've, I've, I've gone to wizard school, but but nobody realizes that I'm not a wizard. I was scared of getting found out, right? I didn't feel a wizard like a wizard because any, anything I managed to create was like the thousandth thing I did after 999 mistakes. You know, I was like banging my head against the wall. I didn't know what I was doing. And occasionally I got lucky. And I was like, oh, they're, they're going to figure out that like I'm not like them, right? I don't have the magic. And actually what happened to me at MIT over four years, I figured out nobody had the magic. There is no magic, right? There are those of us who had like believed this story about geniuses and magic, and there are other people who were just getting on with creating, and the people at MIT were the second group. So um, that was my revelation that I, that I wasn't an imposter. I was doing things the way everybody I'd ever heard of did them. And so um, I did some startups, and then I wanted to write a book, like kind of correcting the record, I guess, because it's frustrating to me like now I'm like, I'm called the inventor of the Internet of Things. I'm not the inventor of the Internet of Things. I wrote three words on a PowerPoint slide. I'm one of 100,000 people that all chipped away at this problem. And probably my chips were not big, as big as a lot of other people's, right? Um, so uh, it was really important to me to talk about that because I meet so many people who want to create something, but if it doesn't like happen instantly or they don't have the brilliant idea in the shower, you know, they think they must be bad at it. And the reality is, um, all, all creating as a series of steps. And as I was writing the book, I researched uh, you know, famous stories like Newton, um, and then less famous stories like the African slave kid who discovered how to, to farm vanilla, right? Um, and found that everybody was doing it the same way. And in every discipline, it doesn't matter if it's Kandinsky painting a painting, or um, you know, some scientist curing cancer, uh, everybody is struggling, they're struggling to be heard, they're struggling to be understood, they're struggling to figure out what to do next, but the ones that succeed just keep going. Um, you know, the title, How to Fly a Horse, is because of the Wright brothers. Because that's how they characterized the problem they were trying to solve, and they're a classic example of 
I mean, literally everybody else was jumping off mountains with wings on their back and dying. And the Wright brothers took this gradual step-by-step -step approach and they were the ones who solved the problem of how to fly. With, with no money and no resources and Samuel Piermont Langley gave up. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, uh, the Wright brothers were bicycle guys and they just figured out how to convert what they knew into something yeah. else. So that's how you create. And we, I mean, we're surrounded by people who know how to do that. But uh, that's, that's the story of how to fly a horse. So what do we make of like a Steve Jobs? Is he an anomaly or is he just surrounded by people who, was he just surrounded by people who know um, how to create? I, I talk about Steve Jobs in the book actually. And um, you know, I think the interesting thing about Jobs um, is defining characteristic as I see it. Uh, and I you know, follow the story of Apple since I was a kid. One of the right. first computers I ever saw was an Apple. Uh, Jobs was never satisfied. He always believed things could be made better. And he was laser focused on trying to make them better. Sometimes to the detriment of the people around him. But that focus on making things better enabled him, yes, to surround himself with people uh, who were good at doing what they did, but also then driving them to achieve things. I mean, the interesting about Apple now is Apple are sadly becoming kind of just another computer company now yeah. without somebody there who is not, I mean, sure, he'd stand up on stage and say, I've made this great thing. But what was going on in his head often was, but I wish that curve was slightly different, or I wish, you know, the next one, I'm going to fix this problem, right? And so the minute you get satisfied with, oh, we're making billions of dollars, everything's great, that's when your innovation starts to, to plummet, right? Mm. So that was, to me, Jobs was, was a classic example of an innovator because he just kept going. He mm. kept wanting to make things Persistence. Better. All right, we got to go. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you, guys. The Cube. Great, great to, to meet you. you, Kevin. All right, keep it right there, everybody. Stu and I will be back with our next guest. This is The Cube. We're live from Liveworks in Boston. We'll be right back.